Educational Communications and this station present Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman. On this series, we explore the effects of human influence on the Earth's ecosystems and discuss solutions to environmental problems which affect the quality of life on this planet. Environmental Directions gives you the kind of information you need to help you participate in decisions impacting your community, the nation, and the world. Now, here's your host, Nancy Perlman. Hello. For the next half hour, we're going to be talking about the ecology and paleoecology of Baja California and the Gulf of California with my guest, Dr. Marcus Johnson. He is the Charles L. McMillan Professor of Natural Science Emeritus at Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. He's a fellow of the Geological Society of America, recipient of the 2011 Nelson Bushnell Prize, and he has co-authored the book, Gulf of California Coastal Ecology, Insights from the Present and Patterns from the Past. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you for having me. This is a great opportunity for me to spin tales about life south of the border. And you certainly have many to tell in your book because you have had over 30 years of field research up and down the coast of Baja, California. Let's begin with explaining that that peninsula south of California in the United States, but in Mexico, was not always a peninsula. You go back to the Pleistocene and the Pliocene and point out that it was connected at one time. What happened? Yes, that's right. The whole peninsula was swung in and attached to mainland Mexico. And it rifted apart. It rifted away from mainland. There's something called the East Pacific Rise, which is a spreading center in part of the Great Pacific Ocean. And it winds its way up into the Gulf, the Sea of Cortez, as it's sometimes called. For your listeners, I think it's especially important to know that it connects with the San Andreas Fault. So that system actually goes all the way through what some people still in Mexico would call Alta California, or Upper California. Baja California means Lower California. Actually, some of the early mariners that explored, Spanish mariners, were under the impression that the whole thing might be an island. They thought if they got up in the northern part there, they could simply sail in from the Pacific Ocean and sail back out of the Pacific Ocean at the other end around what we today would call San Francisco. So it's this rifting process that has actually pulled apart or spread apart the subterranean rocks underneath and opened up this rift. It's a giant rift. The depth of the water in the uh, Gulf of California is amazingly deep. It's 2,700 feet deep at its deepest. So this is not any ordinary embayment or gulf. It's really quite an extraordinary, called a marginal sea sometimes, which is only changing in nature as this rift system continues to expand. The gulf is getting a little bit wider, and it's a little little bit like a zipper unzipping that will eventually force its way up into upper California as well. The ecosystems are very special because they have both marine life, life in the estuaries, lagoons, the sandy beaches, and also the number of plants, a thousand that are found there, many hundreds of vertebrates, but you have focused on over 5,000 species of marine invertebrates. 10% of those are endemic, which means they are found no place else in the world. That's right. You certainly can't research every single one of those, but which ones are special to you? I started going there with an interest in limestone. The limestone uh, would occur next to old shorelines as the gulf was widening out. And the limestone could be made of a lot of different organisms. For example, corals, making coral reefs would be very typical of some of the places that you could go and understand this early opening of the Gulf. It it might sound a little bit funny, but when I was thinking about this interview, I thought of Tom Hanks and the role of Forrest Gump, you know, that movie. Forrest tells, he has a little speech where he says that life is like a box of chocolates and you never know what kind is going to come up next. The Gulf of California is, is really like a huge box of confectionery delights but in two layers. The top layer is the modern ecology. So you can understand or study the modern corals. But when you dig down below, you find the fossil corals preserved exquisitely, a perfect 
morsel, if you will, fossil coral reefs that are now above sea level. And you can actually walk around and imagine what it's like to uh, walk through a reef. There are a good 10 or 11 different ecosystems there that are really enjoyable to study. You have many, many pictures showing some of the very old fossils, the pin shells, the lucinid shells, the clams, the rhodolith Riddle, banks, yes. and yes. the other kinds of ancient animals that are fossilized in these yes. very preserved sand dunes, beaches, limestone. Is there a special kind of rock? Because you have one here of the sculpted granite rocks at Cabo Pulmo mm -hmm. that has some gastropods. You'll have to tell us what those are. Those are intertidal snails, sea snails. There's a pretty good tidal range there and they hang out there. But we can find that ex same exact snail elsewhere in limestone in a former coastline. One thing we have to understand is that uh, sea level has changed quite a bit through time and it was quite a bit higher just 125,000 years ago or even uh, further back four or five million years ago it was higher as well. Because sea level has gone down that's how we can wander around some of the islands and some of the coastal zones in the peninsula and see these formations now high and dry. There are enormous oyster banks for example that cover many square kilometers. It's exposed to the air now. You can actually walk around and see what part of the seafloor was like thousands and even a few million years ago. The coral reefs and the oysters are actually preserved in what we call their life position. It's as if somebody pulled the plug in the bathtub and the water drained out. That really helps scientists. Well, yes. Part of the reason for doing this is to trace the history of the opening of the seaway. What is the evolution of this gulf? How did it open up? Studying the shorelines and the ancient shorelines, you can trace the gradual opening of the gulf from a time before there was no gulf at all and the entire seaway was closed, hadn't opened yet. So as it opens, initially, it was probably like a dry valley, a deep valley below sea level. But once seawater breached the southern area, clear down at the tip of the peninsula, water would have flooded in and brought with it all kinds of marine organisms, including those marine invertebrates like the corals and like the oysters that secrete calcium carbonate and make limestone. So looking for places where you have the limestone actually co-joined with the paleo shoreline tells you about when this uh, flooding event occurred. That's one of the exciting things about doing work there. And of course the other aspect is that there's so many different ecosystems. The limestone has formed a few islands. I don't know how many are in the Gulf of California. And there's a very famous limestone arch down in Cabo San Cabo Lucas. San Lucas. The arch is actually granite. But again, that would be one of the exciting things in that area to go along the granite coast and find limestone that is deposited right snug up against the granite. But yes, there are about 40 named islands up and down the Gulf. They popped up as sort of like corks, you might say. As the rifting occurred, there were major fractures or faults, and there was vertical sliding that allowed these islands to sit above sea level. And of course, many of these islands then had a shelf, a marine shelf, that would be uh, very accessible to marine organisms. In your book, Gulf of California, Coastal Ecology, Insights from the Present, and Patterns from the Past, you discuss some of the marine life and the four varieties in terms of how they feed. Some are stuck to a particular place like barnacles. Others yes. float and catch their prey as they float. Explain the names of those four and how they work. For example, with clams, there are people who like to go out and clam. You know, they collect clams. There are people who love to eat clams. So there are some clams that we call in faunal. They're actually hidden from view. They're down underneath the sand. They have what's called a siphon. It would be something like a little straw that sticks up. The clam might be several inches down below the surface, but it's connected to the surface by a siphon that it uses to suck in seawater that has phytoplankton. It has small plants 
That's how the clam makes its living. It's actually feeding on these tiny single-celled plants. Clams don't exactly have a long lifetime. And there's one clam in particular that I think is quite interesting. In Mexico, they call it the chocolate clam because it has a swirly-like pattern and, and sort of uh, milk chocolate colors. It, well, it's a very delicious clam, as a matter of fact. But these clams would ordinarily live for maybe only seven or eight years uh, to go from baby clam to an adult clam. At the end of a life expectancy of a clam, uh, when it dies, the musculature that actually holds the clams together will disintegrate. And then storms that come along uh, and scour the sea bottom will bring these shells to the surface. So one of the very fun things, extraordinary in my view, there are certain beaches in Baja California that are made 100% of broken clam shells. And they've been jostled around in the water with the waves and broken down into pieces of shell about the size of a nickel or a dime. They're completely smooth, and it's quite extraordinary. So this is one of the kinds of limestones that could be made. One of the islands at Loreto has beaches on the north that are just 100% made of, of broken up clams, but that date back pretty far in time. And you have so much wonderful information about the autotropes, which are the self-feeding plants and bacteria, the herbivores, the plant eaters, the carnivores, the meat eaters, the omnivores, meat and plant eaters, and the detrivores, eaters of organic detritus. Uh, that's right. There's a whole ecosystem, a whole system. Well, we talk about the food pyramid, don't we? So nature also has a food pyramid. And the autotrophs are simply those organisms like the marine algae that photosynthesize and, and they make their own food. But then there are going to be a whole host of things like some of the marine gastropods or snails and then these clams that we talked about who dine on the, the phytoplankton. But then you have other things like animals that will feed on the shellfish themselves. We're going to talk more about all of the different life in the ecosystems of the Gulf of California in Baja, California, when we return in a moment with my guest, Professor Marcus Johnson. Environmental Directions with Nancy Perlman continues with further discussion of the world's critical ecological issues. For more information, you may call 310-559-9160 or go to www.ecoprojects.org. Now, here's Nancy. I'm speaking with Emeritus Professor Marcus Johnson, who is the Charles L. McMillan Professor of Natural Science at Williams College. You have been doing so much fascinating work down in the Gulf of California, in Baja, California. Let's talk a little bit about some of the predecessors to your research because you showed some busts of two individuals, John Steinbeck, who we know of as a novelist, and also of Edward Ricketts. Why are these two individuals important? Ed Ricketts is a, quite a famous marine ecologist. He ran a private company in Monterey, California, supplying schools with specimens that could be used for dissection, for example. He was a graduate uh, from the University of Chicago, which was quite famous at the time for pioneering studies in ecology. And eventually, Ricketts published a book called Between Pacific Tides. It was published by Stanford University Press. It was one of the first books to really uh, focus on marine ecology. Now, it might sound strange to think that John Steinbeck would, would have a connection, but John Steinbeck was an undergraduate at Stanford University, and Stanford had a school for marine studies in Monterey, and that's how he met Ricketts, and the two formed a, a really fast friendship. Publishing a scientific book, as famous as Ricketts became for that book, you don't really make a lot of money. But in 1939, Steinbeck published Grapes of Wrath, and it was an immediate success. He had been a struggling author up to that time, but money started to pour in, and he decided to fund an expedition from Monterey. They would sail down the coast, the outer coast of the peninsula, and then up into the Gulf of California. Quite a famous book, The Log of the Sea of Cortez, that was eventually published. It's quite a cult classic among people who are interested in ecology. But we could also mention, for example, Jacques Costal, the French marine biologist. And he was fascinated by the Sea of Cortez. And he claimed that it was one of the world's premier nurseries for marine organisms because the level of productivity is so high. We talked about autotrophs. We talked about 
heterotrophs, the animals that eat herbivores, the, the carnivores, the, you know, sharks at the very top of the, of the food pyramid and so on. But Jacques Cousteau was just fascinated by the tremendous richness of the Gulf. The reason why this is so rich, at the top of the Gulf, it's so arid that a lot of seawater is just evaporated just off the top. And it's estimated that something like three feet of water per year is simply evaporated right into the air. That's a lot. That's a lot. So you can imagine, if you take that water away, it has to be replaced. Now, if the gulf were completely sealed at the, at the southern end, you would end up with a Death Valley. The whole thing would just be evaporated away, right? But let's talk about some of the fresh water that's no longer getting yes, into the Gulf because other, what a yeah. lot of people don't realize, and I didn't until I went down to Yuma, Arizona, yeah. and the border of United States and Mexico, and realized that the Colorado River, one of our longest rivers in the continental yeah. United States, passing through so many different places, including the Grand Canyon, by the time it gets to the Gulf now, nothing, there's nothing, nothing left. left. And yet yeah, it really used to left. create the delta and the marshlands that were so important to marine life there. And that northern part of the Gulf is unique because it has the smallest, rarest dolphin in the world. Yes, that's right. That's right. And it's, it's slowly going extinct. So that's right. The water is down to a trickle now. And it's still quite impressive if you, if you fly over the area. Uh, and especially if it's, it's low tide, and there's quite a tidal range in that northern part. The size of the delta is amazing, but the amount of water that's trickling in is next to nothing. I mean, everybody is taking their cut. We obviously need to have international agreements, and we obviously need to support the Mexican government in creating national parks and natural protected areas, as they're called in Mexico. They have started doing some of that, and you are also encouraging geoparks. What is that? So a geopark is a concept that was developed by uh, UNESCO and really out of, I would say, jealousy of the fantastic national park system that we have in this country, not only in the United States with places like Yellowstone and Yosemite and so on, but of course Canada also has famous national parks and so does Australia. But many smaller countries have been slow to develop uh, this concept. So the geopark concept is the idea of a local community developing an area that is pristine in its, its natural history, bringing in ecotourists, but the influx of ecotourists will also support the local community. It will give it some strength. And of course, we, we know that's true. Grand Canyon, for example, has Grand Canyon Village. It's a whole city up there that would not exist if uh, we didn't have tourists. Ecotourism is so important to so preserve important. and protect yes. the ecosystems and to support the local communities in their efforts to do so. I've always thought of going down to Baja to see the gray whales that migrate 2,000 miles from Alaska down to Mexico and back. But as we said at the beginning of the show, you have thousands of other species. You also talk about the importance of the variety of ecosystems. And I wasn't thinking of places like the sandy beaches and the coastal sand dunes and the clam flats and the coral beds and reefs that on the land you can see ancient history going back millions of years to the Pleistocene and the Pliocene, and also you talk about estuaries, delta systems, and coastal hydrothermal springs. Can I actually get into a nice hot spring? Yes, you can. You, there are different places where, uh, because the rift is still going on, right, there are hydrothermal waters that are rising up. So there are some places where you might be swimming in the Gulf, and you will actually come into a a zone of, of warm water. Other places are along the shore, and you might dig them out. This book, Gulf of California Coastal Ecology, Insights from the Present and Patterns from the Past, truly describes the life that can be found with the shells. How many different kinds of shells have you collected, and where is the museum of those if we can't make it to Baja, California? <laughs> One of the world's specialists actually is in Arizona who studies this. There's something like 5,000 different species of marine 
invertebrates. Now name some of the invertebrates. Some of the oysters, for example. So oyster, the Latin name is Austria. Okay, so there are maybe three or four different species of oysters that have lived in the past and are still still living today. And sometimes they were just incredibly prolific. Another one would be the different kinds of pectins. Pectin is just the sort of fancy scientific name for a scallop. And again, People like to eat scallops. Some of these can be fairly, fairly large, almost the size of a dinner plate. There's one large muscle that the scallop or the pectin uses to open and, and close its valve. I certainly learned a lot more about invertebrates than I was aware of because I usually think of the ecosystems with the plant life that you see on land and also marine life I think of the birds and the fish. The fishing is a major industry for the local community. Are they working to preserve and protect the species and not overfish? This is a big problem and for example when talking about the food web stingrays it's a strange connection with the scallops stingrays are actually fished and you can make a fake scallop by punching out the muscle on the wing it looks like a scallop and some people say it tastes just as good as a scallop but they're being overfished now i've encountered uh, beaches where they're just carcasses of the stingrays thrown up on the beach and they've been killed and slaughtered and it turns out that mexico has some of the best rules on the books for preserving nature. And there are huge finds. The sea turtles, there are three or four species of sea turtles in the Gulf of California. Now, a sea turtle, I've never eaten turtle myself, but it's said to be very delicious. And if you're a family and you're hungry and you capture a sea turtle, you might have food you know, for several days. But it's illegal to kill these sea turtles, and if you're caught, you will go to prison. So the whole problem with regulations, conservation, in the Sea of Cortez is enforcement. You have to have people who are out there patrolling, like the Coast Guard, for example. They wouldn't be doing this, but some of the, the park people would be out patrolling. But they don't have enough money. They don't have gasoline to put into the boats to run the boats, so they sit on shore. Let's get the tourists the down there to bring in the dollars. That's an important thing as well. I think it's also important that there are scientists like you who are letting us know about the life that is down there, that which we find in the fossil record and that which we find in the current living species. You have taught courses in historical geology, paleontology, stratigraphy in the geosciences department at Williams College during your 35-year career. I want to know how you work with the current biologists and botanists in helping preserve and protect these ecosystems when you're looking at the record from the Pleistocene and the Pliocene and eras and epochs and ages past. There is a really amazing community of scholars, of course internationally, but I have my counterparts in Mexico and so my co-author, uh, Professor Jorge Ledesma, he's also retired like I am, but he formally taught all the same courses that I've taught myself. So I have to thank him. He's the one who invited me to come down and explore with him. But all the different specialists there are people who study fish. There are people who specialize in coral reefs. There are people who specialize in the modern reef. Cabo Pomo, for example, is the one big reef that's, that's there today. But there are also Mexican specialists who only study the fossil corals. It's really an, an international sort of endeavor, and it's a lot of fun to, to get people together from different backgrounds. Since you look at the fossil records, explain why some fossil records are more recent, like three million years ago for the oldest mangrove fossils, but yet you go back over 65 million years to the extensive granite batholiths that yeah. developed. And the marine faunas go maybe 33 some million years ago. Why? Because of evolution. So for example, mangroves, mangroves are an extraordinary plant. It's a flowering plant. It's an angiosperm and it lives in salt water. There, there simply are no other flowering plants that are able to tolerate seawater. We can go back to a time when there were no mangroves. It, it actually evolved, for, you know, for the first time and became a very successful ecosystem. Coral reefs are an, another thing. They go very, very far back in time, but there are many kinds of uh, corals that went extinct. And then the whole process had to begin again with organisms that became corals and did it in a slightly different way. The corals that we see right now in the Gulf of California or in places like the Caribbean or 
the Indo-Pacific, they go back a, a fair amount of time, maybe a couple hundred million years. But they've, in, they've been evolving the whole time. Some species go extinct, and they're replaced by other species. You describe the world of microbes in closed yeah. lagoons, and some of these creatures, I don't think I've seen live or in fossil situations. You talk about the floating microbe by a light scored by desiccation cracks. You talk about thrombolites from the little lagoon. What are these? These are forms of a kind of an algae. They're filamentous. They're blue-green. They're called blue-green algae sometimes. They're some of the oldest organisms on planet Earth. There's a very famous locality called Shark Bay in Western Australia where we have living forms. They look like globular, sort of hemispherical shapes. The ones that we've been finding, and that was a huge surprise. We didn't expect to find this at all. The ones that we've been looking at in these closed lagoons are more like a mattress on a bed, but with multiple layers like blankets. They photosynthesize. That's one of the things they do. But deeper down below the surface, they are actually anaerobic. They can actually live in a uh, environment without oxygen. So these are some of the oldest uh, organisms on the planet. People love to climb dunes and slide down dunes. How many dunes are there? How many sandy beaches are there? There are literally scores and scores of dunes. One of the aspects of the Sea of Cortez is that there's a winter wind that develops um, out of the north, basically from November through maybe May, maybe only a few weeks at a time, every so often, maybe every other month, there'll be a very strong wind that comes down. And for example, some of these clams that we talked about that are forming on the beach, being crushed up, these pieces of the clam will be so small and ground up into a fine powder that the powder blows inland and becomes a dune. So these are not sand dunes in the sense of a silica sand. These dunes in Baja California are largely made of calcium carbonate. They're white, they're like crushed shells. So there are many of these dunes, and the fun thing is that we can actually tell the, the wind direction, even on a nice day, when the wind is not blowing, you can explore the dune, and you can look at the different parts, and you say, oh yes, this dune was actually forming and, and advancing from the north to the south. We can actually use them to study when they're fossilized, and they can be, they, they can become lithified and turn into limestone. We can actually investigate ancient times, ancient winds. What kind of discovery have you made that you didn't expect to find during your work? Well, there were a couple. These uh, stromatolites are these very ancient forms. That was a complete surprise, total surprise. I knew about them because of, of reading and teaching. One of the other discoveries that was quite unique, and I would kind of liken it to a fancy bonbon in a, in a box of chocolates, totally unexpected, are these rotoliths. They're coralline red algae, and they are almost perfectly spherical, and they secrete uh, calcium carbonate. They basically uh, grow in all directions. They're unattached to the seafloor. They're actually rolling around on the bottom of the seafloor. They have to photosynthesize. That's how they actually grow. So there'll be these concentric rings that are growing, and they get larger and larger and larger. Some of these are about the size of a softball, and they could easily be over 100 years old. We talked about the importance of ecotourism, having travelers come down, support the local communities, support the protected areas, the parks, and the wildlife. But yet at the same time, sometimes they can pose problems. We know that the whale watchers can get too close to the whales that need their privacy to breed and give birth. We know that tourists often take things that maybe shouldn't? If they yes. take some of these fossil clams, are they still going to leave enough for you? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't bring things home anymore. I believe in photographs. I was fascinated to learn more about this place that I've been to parts of, and I now I'm ready to go up and down the Mexican Highway number 1 and see even more of it. I want to thank you so very much for providing us with this great resource, letting us know that we have a tremendous ecosystem worth preserving, protecting, and studying. Thank you for being my guest.
Well, thank you so much, Nancy. It's, it's, it's been my pleasure. I have been speaking with Marcus Johnson, who is the Charles L. McMillan Professor of Natural Science Emeritus at Williams College, recipient of the 2011 Nelson Bushnell Prize, fellow with the Geological Society of America, and co-author of Gulf of California Coastal Ecology, Insights from the Present and Patterns from the Past. I'm Nancy Perlman. Thank you very much for joining us, and do tune in again next week. If you would like free information about these environmental issues, go to www.ecoprojects.org or call 310-559-9160. Environmental Directions with your host, Nancy Perlman, is a community affairs program of the nonprofit organization Educational Communications and this station.